Great Writers Series. And this series features authors who either live or have lived in Kentucky and have one or more literary works of high quality. Tonight's event is sponsored by the Reitzel Cook Foundation, LexArts, Kentucky Arts Council, Nate's Coffee, and WUKY. Now, after our last reader has finished tonight, we'll do the Q&A, and the authors will be joining me up front, and then after that, we'll do a book signing. So now we're going to begin. Now we're going to begin meeting our featured authors. Um, if you're just joining us tonight, I'm Jennifer Maddox, coordinator of the Kentucky Great Writers Series. There are many stories shaped by Kentucky experiences, and tonight we'll hear from three female authors of immense talent, each who has their own distinct voice and captivating stories to tell. Now, originally we were going to start with Kentucky poet laureate Crystal Wilkinson, and due to unforeseen circumstances, she was not able to join us tonight, but I do want you to know that Crystal has deep roots at the Carnegie Center. She was a she was an assistant director here at the Carnegie Center way back before my day, and she's also one of our beloved writing instructors. And even though she's not going to be here tonight, um, her book, Black, um, Perfect Black, is going to be sold after the event, so you're still welcome to buy her book. And actually, she launched that book here during the pandemic at the Carnegie Center, so it's a very unusual kind of launch. Um, but reading in her spot is someone else who's also on the Carnegie Center staff, and she is making her mark here at the Carnegie Center. And that is Claudia Love Meyer. So Claudia joined the Carnegie Center staff. <laughs> Claudia Love Meyer. Uh, Claudia joined the Carnegie Center staff in 2020 as coordinator of the Kentucky Black Writers Collaborative, which is a support center for black writers, whether they're published or unpublished. And this is from writers around the state. Um, the KBWC nurtures literary development and removes financial obstacles by providing 100 plus free classes throughout the year, as well as the Black and Lit book group and some special programs. So you may see Claudia in seeing an event. You may be here when she's teaching a class, such as how to be an anti-racist writer. Um, but she's one of those authors who can write in pretty much any genre, and her books prove it. She's got over 10 published books. Um, including mysteries, Christian fiction, and she also has a memoir called Don't You Fall Now. One of the benefits of working with published authors is sometimes they will read their works to you outside of a normal setting. And so one day at lunch, Claudia pulled open a book in progress, her young adult novel, and started reading to us. And, you know, it was gorgeously written, it was very inventive, and this was a draft. So if we could all write drafts like Claudia's, she's a fantastic writer. Now, she does have three books she's planning to finish writing by the end of the year. She is a very busy writer, and um, one of those is called Morning Pages. And I think she's maybe going to read a little bit of that to us tonight if we're lucky. So, um, please welcome Claudia Love Meyer. that I created called After You Went to Sleep, Prose and Poetry to My Son. Um, on October 17th, my 32-year-old son died of a drug overdose. I began to write about it on Facebook while my virtual community, probably some of you here, uh, some of the poems from that time are gathered here. They are a work in progress, and all of this work is going to appear in morning pages, working through Brief the Right Way, uh, W-R-I-T-E. It will be a guide to helping people process grief through writing. That's coming out in 2023 in the fall from Chalice Press. Um, at the time that I put this collection together, I had PTSD so badly that I could not look at my son's picture, nor could I say his name without completely falling apart. So I adapted the Facebook post to not say his name except for one time at the very end. And um, I put this together four months after he died. It is now seven months after he died. I have not looked at this work for a while. Um, who knows <laughs> if I'm going to cry, but Jennifer has tissue right there. Um, we're going to start at the very beginning. Uh, this poem is called The Coroner at 3 a.m. The coroner came bearing pictures that cold October morning. The time was 3 a.m. 
He told me and Abby to brace ourselves so they would be hard to see. Then one photo at a time, he took you away from me. The first photo was your tattoo, a tree, black creeping branches sprawling up your arm like veins. The second was a red t-shirt I watched you effortlessly slide on that day. Now a pause before the hardest of them all, your undeniable sleeping face. God, how I wish I hadn't seen the coroner at 3 a.m. with his grim and breaking news ruthlessly changing everything. I have hundreds, maybe more, of friends who are writers. And um, this is a haiku about what, without fail, they all said. All the writers said, after you went to sleep, that they have no words. Um, this is when, uh, at the time of COVID, during the time of COVID, uh, a lot of things were still closed last October, and so we were unable to go to the morgue for me to identify his body. The pictures that the coroner brought was how I identified him. Um, and I knew my son would not want a funeral, and so he went straight from morgue to crematorium. There was no opportunity for me to say goodbye to his physical body. And so I um, practically begged the crematorium director to please let me have a moment with my son before um, you cremate him. And it was against the rules, but somehow he took pity on me and let me do it. Um, this poem is called Crematorium. You looked asleep. I imagined you resting after the tall day, after the last time you laughed while the sun ribboned dusk into streaks of flame, after the black sky swaddled you, blanketing you in stars while you lay silently on the ground, fingers of grass stroking your arms, the night shadows grown long. I pictured you reviewing your day, saying your longing prayers, taking your medication and waiting for peace before you closed your eyes and finally went to sleep. In the end, before the fires burned the shell you left behind, I, Mama, kissed your brow, now gone cold. I wouldn't eat or drink once I got home, not while the chill of your forehead lingered on my lips. Um, the next one is called After Everyone Was Gone. After everyone was gone, I threw away the flowers but kept the dried lavender and yellow roses. They were still beautiful, even dead. I took down the Halloween decorations because your lingering haunted me. I cleaned, I cleared, I cried, tried to will myself whole, failed to will myself whole and cried again, but I stayed vertical, the harder choice most days. I didn't stop tossing flowers and taking down ghosts. I kept moving. That had to be enough after everyone was gone. This is not a poem, son. It just looks like one. I longed to dream of my son and I have had a total of three dreams about him. This is the first one, um, dream one. You visited my dream, stood in the kitchen plundering the cabinets, found a pack of ramen and asked, can I have this? Dry chicken flavored noodles hung limp in your hand. Confused, I think, but you were dead. Yet there you were, grinning wide, shaking your dreadlocked head at the statement I never said. You looked at me, love like a small child's in your eyes, but you were quiet as a tomb. I had one question. I asked you, are you here? You, my boy whose ashes sweep the depths beneath the gown of a waterfall, 
my now sleeping, never waking, slumber taken boy. Are you here? I reached for you, but you had passed, waving on my grass. You strolled down the hall, ignoring your brother on the sofa, and I, as desolate as a burial ground, asked my only living son if you're here. But he was silent, so I rushed behind you, not ready to lose you once again. Are you here? The words chase you down, but they faded in the air, and like a last breath, they were gone. I could not get to you so close. You weren't even a ghost headed to your sister's room. That endless hall, how many miles long. You were out of my reach, you looking solid like a rock of a boy thrown to a shore far away from me. Is he here? I asked your sister, but she was quiet as death. Then you were gone. I bolted awake, bursting through the sepulcher of sleep, my hand flying to my racing heart, this gesture of a mother bereft who has lost her son, even in her dreams, and you were not here. Um, this one is called Beautiful Things. Don't worry about me. I still find pleasure in beautiful things. My glittery shoes and Christmas socks, blanketed in falling leaves from ginkgo trees. This is the second dream that I had about him. Dream two. Every time I dream of you, you're leaving. In the chaos of my sleeping mind, you're ready to go. This time you're in fatigues, green and brown like the earth and grass you lay on before you went to sleep. You held a duffel bag, a black burden that looked as heavy as a smothering night. I'm wearing a dress the color of a white winter sky, a blood red scarf like a severed umbilical cord tied about my neck. I do not understand these troubling dreams. You looked at me, round-shouldered, fatigued. The garment you wore, I don't understand the symbols in dreams. Was the bag you shouldered the weight of your addiction? I don't get these things. Scattered like detritus in my dreams. I wanted to hold you before you went away. A long, strong hug around your neck. But you slipped out of my arms and went away. And I woke up wondering if I'll ever make sense of the senseless things that happen in these dreams. Um, the last one. I'm going to read it's not actually a poem. It is a piece of prose that I wrote uh, the night that I released him. This is the one time that I said his name in this collection, and this is the one that may make me cry. So. It's called The Release. We made our way toward the waterfall, Abby and me. Our phones lighting the way down slick stone stairs. I carried the ornate box with your cremains. Abby held the screwdriver. I'd have to unscrew the bottom, the only access to the plastic bag you were in. In the frigid November air, we kept our heads down. The circles of our phone lights no match for the inky dark. We trudged behind a crowd of chattering moonbow seekers, none of which were likely to say goodbye to their child that night. The bustling throng in the upper observatory obscured our view. All we could see before us was wet rock wall. I couldn't let you go in that crowd, so we changed course toward the lower observatory where few had gone. To keep from falling, our gaze has never strayed from the slippery stony steps. When we'd gone down as far as it was possible to go, a thin metal rail stood before us, and when we lifted our eyes, we saw magic. There she was, Cumberland Falls, that grand lady, dressed resplendently in a gown of falling water. At the sight of her, I drew in my breath, stunned by the wonder. It felt as if my heart would beat out of my chest. As magical as that, above the lady's cascade, a perfect arc of glowing white, like a halo, lit the lofty night. The moon bow I feared I wouldn't see like a welcoming smile greeted me. 
Though I'd never seen her, this waterfall knew who I was and what I'd come to do. And all at once I knew her, too. If nature ever equaled divine love, Mama God and nature had come and asked for you, my son. My fear of your ashes vanished. Abby gave me the screwdriver and turned her iPhone flashlight toward me so I could see what I'd come to do. Mama waited patiently while I loosened the screw, my fingers numb from the cold. It was hard, but you gotta do what you gotta do. In one swift motion, I pulled the plastic bag out and set the box on the wet ground. I held your ashes to my heart, letting myself feel the weight and how they shifted in the bag like sand. Everything around me faded. Abby, the rest of the crowd, until there was nothing left but you and me, a waterfall and a moon bow. I held you for a long time, cradling you as my tears mingled with the soft spray of water. I undid the twist tie and heard the clank of the metal tag attached hit the ground. With every bit of tenderness in me, I opened the bag. I dropped my head. It was time to say goodbye. Before I released you. Now I lifted my head, Mama Waterfall in her white gown stretched her arms toward me, saying, Mama, it's time. I took a deep breath, leaned over the whale, and poured what remained of you between her stone feet and luminous skirt. Goodbye, son. I love you so much. You belong to God and the ancestors now, and to Mama Waterfall. Thank you, thank you, thank you, I whispered into the night. For letting me be Lumumba, Allende, Ede, Bandelay's mama, and for mothering me tonight. I took a deep and healing breath, knowing you are one with nature now, and I will find you in the breath of the wind, the blue of the sky, and in the slanted silver rain. And every time I visit Mama Waterfall in her fine mist, I will feel you touch my face making my heart a waterfall flowing deep and wide and wild. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia, for that very moving piece. Well, next I'd like to introduce you to an emergency room doc turned novelist. Henry Martin grew up in Berea, went to med school at University of Louisville and Vanderbilt University, and now lives in Charleston, North Carolina. Her debut novel, The Queen of Hearts, was already making a big splash on the literary scene when we invited her to be a reader at one of our previous Kentucky Great Writers events. And since that time, her novels have been featured on dozens of must-read lists, and she's received numerous star reviews. Now, when she launched The Antidote to Everything in this room in 2020, it was February, um, there was this new thing called COVID-19 that was starting to infect part of the country, but it had not really come much into the U.S. at that time, just a little bit up in the Pacific Northwest, and there was still talk about, will this, how will this spread, will this be something that we have to worry about? Well, you all know how that ended, and um, the interesting thing was is that night, Kimberly told us that she'd been working on a novel for over a year about a pandemic, and she had while researching this book, interviewed several, I mean, I can't even tell you how many people she interviewed from the CDC about infectious diseases. She was one of the experts in the room that night for sure, because she knew a lot about infectious diseases leading up to her book, which has since come out. It's called Doctors and Friends. And um, I want to read just a few of the reviews that she's received for that already. 
um, a Star Review and Publishers Weekly said, this fully realized account of a fictional pandemic Manage to, manages to convey the deeply personal as well as the bigger pi picture. Now, People Magazine called this a prescient, human, and hopeful portrait of medical experts on a pandemic's front lines. And in case you're wondering if this novel is only about a pandemic, it's actually about so much more. And I really like what um, Library Journal said in their star review, which was, there's beauty in Martin's gem of a story that confirms that friendship is a powerful force. Please welcome Kimberly Martin. Thank you, Jennifer. And thank you, Mike, for giving us a break after Claudia's beautiful reading. I needed to take a minute. Um, that was truly stunning. Um, and I just didn't want to follow you. Um, so I usually start by telling people the timeline of Doctors and Friends. Um, I had the first idea for the book in 2018 when I was writing an article about what I was writing next. And then I researched, drafted, and sold the novel to the publisher in 2019. And the reason that is relevant is because the book is about a group of female doctors who are all friends from medical school who happened to be traveling abroad together during the initial outbreak of what turns out to be a brand new worldwide viral pandemic. And as soon as I tell people this, I usually apologize for bringing this upon us because clearly I did. Um, so originally the publisher was going to pitch the novel to readers as the hot zone meets Sophie's Choice. If you have read either of those books, you're now cringing. I see him cringing back there. <laughs> um, because the main character in the book is a doctor named Kira Marchand, and she is um, an infectious disease specialist at a branch of the CDC called the Epidemic Intelligence Service, which is a real branch of the CDC that investigates and constrains viral outbreaks. And her particular area of expertise happens to be this new virus that is just starting to take hold in the world, and so she becomes instrumental in the American response to the virus. But near the end of this fictional pandemic, both of her children become deathly ill, and she just happens to have access to one dose of an experimental antiviral medication, and she has to select which child will receive it. Now, I know that sounds implausible, but I actually got the idea and loosely based it on two real-world occurrences. One, the 2014 Ebola outbreak in Western Africa, and one, an occurrence that happened in the Central African country of Chad in 2018, in which real-life people actually did have access to an experimental drug on one, in one case and a, a hard-to-access drug in another case and had to pick between individuals. So about the time that I finished the first draft, it was early 2020, I was on my book tour for the second novel I wrote, The Antidote for Everything, and I was telling audiences about the third book. And my publisher called and said, I think we might not publish this book. Um, this was early 2020, and we were saying things to each other like, this could last a month. <laughs> and by the time this book comes out, because the wheels of publishing, publishing turn so slowly, everyone in the world will have experienced a pandemic. And it will be impossible to read a book about a pandemic without applying the filter of your own experience to that. We talked about it. We ultimately decided to publish it. They asked me to rewrite the book because, my editor said, while everyone in the world will have lived through an actual pandemic by the time this book is out, not everyone will have lived through a pandemic on the front lines. So if you could take a couple of the secondary characters in the book who were already there and already had their own story arcs, and give them a first-person point of view perspective to show a little bit more of what it's like to be a doctor on the front lines. So I rewrote the book in early 2020 and turned it in. Um, I am not going to read you an excerpt related to virology or a pandemic because, um, as Jennifer so kindly said, there are other things in the book. So this passage, I hope, illustrates a little bit of the humor and the sweetness and what I think is the concept of friendship and of parenthood as fundamental human relationships. 
So this, this scene takes place in Atlanta near the CDC, um, years before the pandemic when one of the characters is having a baby. Bo had been born on a snowy night in January. It was a date that would become infamous in the city and even the country. A winter storm paralyzed Atlanta, stranding people in their cars for upwards of 18 hours. When the first late morning flakes began to fall, panic swept the city as every business, school, and government office made the regrettable decision to let out at the same time. Within minutes, hundreds of the ill-prepared commuters spun out and crashed. The interstate snarled to a dead stop, clogged with wrecked cars and trapped 18-wheelers. Some people staggered out of their cars, abandoning them in the middle of the roadways in search of refuge in grocery stores and gas stations. Others hunkered down in their shrouded vehicles, peeing into soft drink cans and calling in frantic updates to loved ones as their cell phone batteries dwindled. Children spent the night in their school gymnasiums, their little bodies pressed together, their inadequate lightweight coats rolled into pillows. The landscape across the city resembled something from the front lawn of the White Witch, studded with terrible, silent statues of flash-frozen southerners. Okay, I'll admit it, that last description might involve a little bit of hyperbole. As far as I know, people had not instantly turned to ice, at least not on a Narnian scale, but the rest had been true, and it had been bad. The national media, especially in the upper latitudes of the country, swept into a fever of righteous schadenfreude as Metro Atlanta shuddered to its knees. Snowmageddon. South Park. The Ice Age Doomsday Zombie Snowpocalypse. The citizens of Boston and Minneapolis and Buffalo watched the nightly news broadcast with no small degree of glee as every announcer in the northern half of America reported that the snow removal apparatus of the city of Atlanta apparently consisted of one intoxicated redneck with a plow duct taped to his Ford F-150. You might, said the smirking announcers, reasonably wonder what calamitous amount of snowfall it took to create such an epic mess. One foot? Two? Could it be three? The Yankee ridicule soared to the stratosphere as a CNN reporter, stranded at headquarters off Marietta Street, shamefacedly admitted the final snow accumulation. Two inches. <laughs> this is real, by the way. <laughs> Two inches. That was all it took to transform I-85 into a vast parking lot. And that was all it took to prevent me from reaching the hospital when the labor pains began. The initial plan had been for me to call Bonnie, who was temporarily living with her parents when my time was nigh. Bonnie would collect Rory and deposit her with a colleague before driving me to Emory, where she would stay with me and wipe my brow and whisper encouragement as my fatherless baby boy made his entrance into the world. But when I reached her, she sounded alarmed. Now, she yelped, now, Kiki, have you looked outside? It's snowing, I know. I said through gritted teeth. The pains had started hours ago, but I dismissed them as breakfast and hicks until their strength and regularity made them impossible to ignore. Now I had timed them to be three minutes apart. I needed Bonnie to come. It's more than snowing, it's icy, said Bonnie, who considered anything below 60, to 60 degrees to be intolerably arctic. If I'd been capable of a normal degree of focus, I'd have appreciated a certain wildness in her tone that went beyond a distaste of the cold. But another contraction started, and it silenced me. Kiki, you okay? <sighs> I breathed, trying not to whimper. Oh God, said Bonnie. Her tone changed again. Kira, I'm stuck on Lindbergh. This was one of the main thoroughfares, a road that often felt victim to rush hour traffic snarls. Well, hurry, I said, once the contraction abated. I can't hurry, I can't do anything. We haven't moved in ages. What? Turn on the TV. I carried the phone to the living room, the only room with the television. Rory and I had moved to Atlanta from Africa two months before my due date, residing in a two-bedroom apartment designed by the blandest person in the universe. I had named it the Beige Box because of its beige walls, beige carpet, beige tile, and beige counters. Someone had gone rogue in the bathroom and installed a white toilet which gleamed like a tooth amid all the beige. 
I hated this place. If you started at the doorway and panned out and up, like a Hollywood camera at the end of a film, you'd see our apartment was one of 12 identical apartments in the beige building, which is one of 30 identical buildings in a beige complex, which was one of hundreds of identical, boring, boxy beige complexes in this part of town. But this was what I could afford. I padded, lumbered across the beige carpet to the beige couch and groped between the cushions for the remote. Turn it to CNN, commanded Bonnie's tinny little voice from the phone. I complied and gaped the image on the screen. A 16-lane section of I-85 bisected by a concrete median, dusted in white and strewn with cars. The cars sat immobile, some of them angled to the side, some turned backward, some broken up by the occasional rectangle of a jackknife semi. What happened? It's snowing. Okay. I'd classify this situation as hell freezing over, said Bonnie. No one is going anywhere. Bonnie, I'm going to have the baby. Today, I think. Listen, don't do that, she said. Hold off until tomorrow. Bonnie! Another pain seized me. Oh, Kiki, I'm sorry. The music stopped. She must have switched off the car's sound system. I'm going to call 911 for you. Okay, but, I said. My voice came out distorted by pain. Rory's here. I'll get there somehow, I promise. Can a neighbor take her until then? I don't know any neighbors, I, I gasped, leaning forward. A gushing warmth slid down my thigh, pulling onto the carpet. I'll figure out something. It'll be okay, I promise. While no one would relish the, the thought of a solitary home delivery, I wasn't as worried about the mechanics of the process as one might expect. I had delivered dozens of babies in Chad, almost all of them without anesthesia of any kind. Delivering my own baby would occur from a different vantage point, to be sure, but if Downey or an ambulance couldn't reach me, I was confident I could do it. What complicated everything was Rory. She'd been playing in her room, but now, lured out by the siren call of television, she crept up beside me. Hi, Mommy. From her father, Rory had inherited beautiful brown skin and deep brown eyes. She had a tiny rounded nose and pearly teeth and the careless, luminescent beauty of childhood. She cast a glance toward the television and a sly flicker lit her eyes. How about Dora, mommy? She said. When I didn't answer, she expounded, enunciating each word. Dora, the explorer. <laughs> Mommy isn't feeling great, I managed. Oh, okay. To my surprise, Rory didn't press her case. This was unusual. Since we'd arrived in the States, Rory had fallen under the sway of the television, lobbying for it with the single-minded fervor of a seven-year-old who could not understand why anyone wouldn't want to indulge in this throbbing, noisy miracle every waking second. I eased myself onto the couch, panting. If no ambulance arrived, could I do this myself without terrifying my daughter? The walls of the beige box might as well have been constructed of cloth for all the good they did in blocking noise, so I'd have to figure out how to explain the sounds to Rory. Having given birth once before, I doubted my ability to do it silently. Rory reappeared in the living room, dragging behind her an overstuffed red toque. She had changed clothes. Instead of the pink velour pants and garish Disney sweatshirt she'd been wearing, she was now clad in what appeared to be a pillowcase. I rallied up from the depths of my self-absorbed pain to do a double take. It was indeed a pillowcase, a fine blue cotton one from my bed, with three ragged holes cut out for a neck and arms. What? I began. Shh! Rory puttered around, extracting a slew of items from the tote bag. It's time for spa! I peered at an odd array of items as she lined them up on the coffee table. A sleep mask from our last flight a half-melted soy candle from the bathroom, a toy whisk, a toy whisk, Roy's beloved copy of the big book of celestial facts, a fluid-filled globe. Rory picked up this last item and gave it a vigorous shake before handing it to me. Inside the plastic ball, a blue color swirled. Breathe, she commanded. A contraction began. I sucked in air and blew it out through pursed lips, trying to envision the pain receding away, carried out on a gust of wind over a peaceful sea. 
Instead, the pain glommed up at the horizon, forming a cartoonish tornado that headed back toward me with a vengeance. I blew harder. That's very good, said Rory approvingly. She spoke in an affected voice, somehow managing to sound both lulling and bossy. After pulling a pink plastic bottle from her bag, she pecked at the lid until it popped up. I'm now going to rub lotion into your head. Wait, I said feebly. No, wait, but it was too late. Rory had flopped the glob of Johnson's baby lotion onto my forehead at the hairline. She picked up the whisk and swirled the lotion into my hair, creating an enormous greasy tangle. Ugh, I moaned. Now I will tell you soothing facts, said Rory, and then we will have classical music until you are calm. The contraction ebbed. If I was going to escape from spa, this was my chance. Instead, I sank back onto the couch and allowed my eyelids to drift most of the way down, so only a sliver of beige was visible. Everything went fuzzy. Relax, a voice boomed directly into my ear, and I will tell you about black holes. My eyes flew open. Next to me, Rory's hand rose, clasping a thin, cylindrical object. Wincing, I understood what was going to happen a split second too late. Rory tootled her recorder loudly right next to my ear. She stopped and drew in a breath. Soothing music. She blasted the recorder again at several screechy pitches. Rory, I said, I have to tell you something. Did you know black holes can burp out stardust? Yes, no, I, I don't know. Rory, your baby brother is coming. Hurtly, she looked around. Where? I patted my belly. He is coming out. Rory nodded. I know, Mom. He will be very small and helpless. <laughs> Thank you to Claudia Lovemeyer. Thank you, Kimberly Martin, um, for sharing pieces of your books with us tonight. Um, our third reader is debut author Whitney Collins, who's also a Lexington native. Um, Whitney was nominated for the Kentucky Great Writers Series by a Spalding MFA and writing program staff person who told us, Whitney is a major new talent who only recently graduated. Now, Whitney doesn't know that they told us that, but um, at the time, her short story collection hadn't hit bookshelves yet. And, um, but it had won the Mary McCarthy Prize for Short Fiction from Louisville Cerebane Books, who also published the book. Um, and um, it didn't take long for this book of short forms to make a big splash. Big Bad is also the winner of an Ippy, uh, is it right, Ippy? Okay, so Big Bad is also the winner of an Ippy Award gold medal for short story slash fiction, and is a finalist for Indies Award for Short Stories. Now, one of the stories in this collection did win a pushcart prize, and um, another story got a pushcart special mention. She's also won other awards and honors for her writing. Uh, Kirkus Review says that Whitney's debut story collection, Big Bad, has beautifully written, wildly imaginative stories. When Collins flirts with magic rather than fully embraces it, she captures the myriad ways the real world is mysterious, filled with both wonder and terror. Publishers Weekly also liked her offbeat, highly high, sorry, her offbeat, high concept world building, which, according to the Southern Review of Books, is a deliciously dark world in which anything is possible and the most horrifying is probable. Now, if this is your vein of gold, I will tell you that Whitney is one of our uh, mentors in the Carnegie Center Author Academy, a program you might want to check out. Um, and we're hoping that we will get her to teach a Carnegie Center class at some point, because um, this sounds just so intriguing. So now, let's hear from Whitney Thomas. I don't know who said that, but thank you. <laughs> um, it is just an honor to be here. It's um, Fantastic, and just to, to be included with Claudia and Kimberly is, is a delight because they are immensely talented, and I know Claudia very well, and I've had the joy of meeting Kimberly tonight, so um, I'm emotional. That was very kind, and emotion, emotions running high because of Claudia's lovely, lovely piece, so um, thank you for sharing that. Um, Big Bad is my, was my thesis, basically, from Spalding University when I graduated in 2018. It was originally 16 stories, and Sarah Van, we whittled it down to a lucky 13. Um, most of them, like 
like Jennifer said, are literary fiction, but there's a lot of borderline horror involved, um, some magical realism, and a lot of dark humor. So if that's your cup of tea, you will like this. If it's not, you will be mildly disturbed, probably. <laughs> um, but I love writing about um, the light and the dark. I love juxtaposition. I love putting humor next to the very difficult to swallow. Um, I like writing about underdogs versus those in power. Um, a lot of my stories have wealth versus poverty, um, male versus female. So there's, there's always a little battle going on in my stories. And tonight what I'm going to do is, and I like to do this at readings, is to read the first page of several stories. Because I think the first page is really important as a short story writer. Um, that's where your reader is going to decide whether or not they want to continue reading. That is where an editor is going to decide whether or not they want to publish in their literary magazine. And a lot of times for me as a writer, I will even know after the first page if I want to keep writing it. So I, I think there has to be a lot front-loaded in a short story. Mystery, tension, um, you have to hook them early because it's, it's a short piece. So I'm going to read the first page of several stories and maybe it'll, I, I kind of call it the appetizer platter. So we will get started. I'm going to begin with, I'm going to begin with a magic realism one. This will be the most fantasy type one that I read tonight. Lonely Hearts. Lenora's first heart arrived in a box of Rice Krispies. It fell into her cereal bowl with a damp thud, and for a brief moment she mistook it for a hunk of roast beef. It was crimson in spots, and silver in others, as if it had touched a hot skillet, but when Lenora, startled, splashed it with some two percent milk, the heart turned an all-over vivid fuchsia and fully came to life. It twitched off a few grains of puffed rice, and sputtered for a time, its veins and arteries unfurling like bean sprouts. When it finally found its bossa nova, it thumped the cereal bowl clear across the table and onto the floor where the bowl shattered. The heart escaped, dancing out of the kitchen and into the hall where Lenora trapped it with an overturned spaghetti strainer, the way she might secure a loose hamster. Lenora bathed the heart in the kitchen sink. She washed the cereal from it with care, as well as some dust and lint and two fragments of cereal bowl. When she was done, Lenora set the heart on a pot holder and stared. Its beat was now serene, and Lenora, single and childless, felt a rush of self-satisfaction she had always assumed was reserved for the married or maternal. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I hope people feel when you get just a little bit. It's like a teaser. Okay. Good guys. To be fair, the kid was asking for it. The moment he stumbled into Holbrook College's cooperative dorm with his archaic set of yam-colored suitcases and big Midwestern smile, he might as well have passed around engraved invitations to his own ass-kicking. He arrived at the collective during a rowdy dinner of wine and lentil loaf, and as he stood grinning in the dining room doorway, the late August sun made a nimbus of his prairie-colored hair. Hello, folks, he said, breathless with innocence. I'm Leonard Saltz from Illinois. You can call me Leonard or Lee or Leo or Leon, whatever floats your boat. Leonard's earnestness was palpable. It brought all 40 collectives, their banter and scraping of tin plates, to a hush. Bjorn, okay, this one's, this is, a, this is horror. This one's a little creepy. By the time Bianca turned 12, there had been 12 doctors in total. If Bianca's mother had had her way, there would have been 1,200. The only reason her mother stopped with the doctor train was because Bianca's father threatened to leave with his wallet if she continued. Still, Bianca's cyst was her mother's whole life, and Bianca's mother's obsession with the cyst was Bianca's whole childhood. The cyst protruded from Bianca's forehead in a way that was hardly noticeable to most people, but caught the light in a way that was always noticeable to Bianca's mother. It looks like you've run into a door, her mother would say, squinting at Bianca's hairline. Like you've given yourself a goose egg. I'm afraid people think you're clumsy. 
Eleven of the twelve doctors said the same thing to Bianca and her mother. It's a dermoid cyst. There's really no reason to remove it. The twelfth doctor said the same, plus, plus some. It's what we call... Oh, this is perfect. <laughs> Unless it's on fire. Okay. This is just a little background, appropriate noise. The twelfth doctor said the same, plus some. It's what we call a banished twin. It never developed in your womb, he pointed to Bianca's mother. So your forehead absorbed it, he pointed to Bianca. The doctor leaned his face close to Bianca as he made this pronouncement. There's no need for surgery, unless it turns problematic. Now scoot, young lady. Live your life. In the car, Bianca's mother wept. Bianca hoped it was because her mother was blaming herself, but she knew it was because the doctor had deemed neither the cyst nor Bianca problematic. All right. I'm going to read from The Entertainer. This was the one that won the fish cart. And this is kind of the rich, rich versus poor um, themed stories. The Entertainer. Mrs. Billingsley asks Rachel's mother, not Rachel, if Rachel would like to accompany them to the beach for two weeks. There's no television, no AC. It's almost embarrassingly primitive. But Rachel is just so entertaining, such a delight. I know she'd make my girls happy. This is how Mrs. Billingsley puts it to Rachel's mother over the phone one evening after Rachel has been particularly engaging at tennis. And Rachel's mother in her outdated kitchen still humiliated by her divorce, her hatchback, and her teeth, replies, yes, yes, absolutely, without even asking Rachel if going to the beach for two weeks with the Billingsleys is something she wants to do. If Rachel's mother's own life is unsalvageable, her daughter still has a shot. She pictures what Rachel can look like in five years if she goes to the beach and puts on a good show for these folks, meets the people they know. If Rachel is willing to do her little song and dance thing at night while the Billingsleys drink gin, teach the talentless Billingsley girls how to macrame, lip sync, hula hoop, Rachel, if she's lucky, might end up as decadently bored and unafraid as they are. All right, I'm gonna read a little bit from The Nest. On Tuesday, Frankie's father took her two places against his better judgment. The first was to see her premature brothers at the Our Lady of Peace NICU. Three days prior and 60 days too early, James and Jasper had slipped out of Frankie's mother like a pair of fetal insects that doctors promptly secured under glass for observation both scientific and sacred. In the ensuing emergency, Frankie's father, unable to locate a sitter, deposited his six-year-old daughter on the foot of his blind mother's nursing home bed with a naked baby doll and a box of sun-made raisins. For two days, Frankie watched The Young and the Restless and Who Wants to Be a Millionaire from a vinyl recliner, eating saltines and applesauce and drinking Boost, while her grandmother's friends leaned on walkers in the doorway, admiring her like a misplaced peacock. She's a prodigy, the grandmother claimed. She's in first grade and can balance a checkbook. She knows all the Canadian provinces. Every so often, the grandmother would run her fingers over Frankie's soft face as if her eyebrows were made of braille and tell her that her baby brothers would probably die. They're like worms on a summer sidewalk, child. They don't stand a, st a chance in the heat of this world. To Frankie, this honesty felt so much like affection, she sometimes asked her grandmother to repeat herself, which the grandmother did with gusto, adding details about Frankie's father and her uncle Eric, how they weren't born early, but they'd been stuck together at the hips, and the doctors had had to slice the grandmother open to remove them. I was the one who almost died, she said. Those boys were laying inside me side by side like a butterfly. Your father, he got the hip. Eric, he never was right. At this, the grandmother patted Frankie's face and body with her hands. Looks like you'll make it, she said. You're one of the lucky ones. All right, one more. Um, I'm gonna do, if I can find it, a horse lamp. Jared had been called to the girl's house to fix her satellite dish, but when he got to the peeling blue rental and walked around its weedy perimeter, he saw that the girl didn't have a satellite dish. She had cable. 
Jared tried to explain the difference between the two services while the girls stood barefoot on the stoop wearing a see-through tank top and a pair of minuscule cutoffs. Jared noticed that the girl had dirty feet, filthy, really, and that her toenails were painted the color of mustard. Both of her pinky toes were curled in against the others like two cold grubs. While Jared talked, he imagined the girl, shoeless at the drugstore, standing in the nail polish aisle for a while before stealing a bottle of yellow polish when no one was looking. He saw her walk right past the cashier. For a good portion of his satellite and cable explanation, Jared looked at the girl's feet and imagined her shoplifting. He did this to avoid looking her in the eye. To look at her made Jared feel dizzy. It made him feel like he might keel over in the red landscape gravel that was scattered around the tiny house. What I'm getting at, Jared finally said, is that I can't fix your satellite dish because you got no satellite dish. And I'm not allowed to fix the cable, seeing how I don't even work for the cable company. The girl twisted a lock of dry copper hair around one of her fingers until her finger turned lilac. Aw, now, she said. Ain't fixing a TV just fixing a TV? Whatever happened to being a gentleman? She winked at Jared and switched her wad of gum from one cheek to the other. Jared could see her flat breast through the white tank top. It looked like two eggs in a skillet, and he thought he might lose consciousness. I'm sure you can figure out how to fix it, the girl exhaled. I really need my TV, because TV is my whole life. And um, if I could have both Kimberly and Claudia come to the front. Um, I told you all we would have a question and answer session, so this is your opportunity to ask some questions, if you'd like, during tonight's event. So, um, I will bring the mic around if someone does have a question. When you're in the writing process, when do the other elements become clearer to you? So I'm going to hand over the mic. Testing, it works. And I handed the mic to you, Kimberly. You don't have to answer first, but you just have to be closest, so. Well, I, <laughs> I think most writers uh, define themselves somewhere along a continuum of plotters who outline and who know what the plot is go how the plot is going to unfold, and pantsers, the seat of your pants people, who prefer to sit down and vomit out 100,000 words <laughs> of complete gibberish, which then must be somehow wrangled into coherence later. Um, and I fall solidly into the second category. I usually think first of the character. Um, and maybe that's because I'm not a very good plotter. <laughs> I'm working on it. I wish I, wish I were more of an outliner than I am, but for me, the character always sort of comes to mind first. My brain does weird things, and there is no way that I would plot out a story. So I just happen to talk too much and be a really cheap storyteller. <laughs> so it usually starts with some kind of premise, except for my exorcist story uh, series. Um, I was just texting with a friend, and um, a friend, another friend had written a, a book called The Demon Chaser or something like that. And I was like, hmm, I'm going to write about somebody kicking demons' butts. She would be black and a teenager. And I would call her The Exorcista. <laughs> and then we howled because that was so funny. But I really never intended to write one, much less three of those. So, you know, in that case, it, it was, you know, like a funny kind of, well, the character came first, and then like a really funny thing. So, it's usually premise. Well, I'm in awe because they've written novels, and I'm attempting to write a novel right now, and it's a completely different animal than a short story. Um, and I've tried not plotting it, and I've tried plotting it, and, um, it's still challenging. So I think either way, it's just the length that if you have to sustain a plot for a novel is a little intimidating to me. And just kind of that plot arc is so much longer than it is in a short story. But for a short story, I usually get an incident. I think of an incident that happens that is a little bit outrageous. And then um, I think, what if this happened 
And sometimes I actually get the ending first. Um, and so sometimes I'll just kind of have the incident and then maybe an ending, and then the, the majority of my writing is, is the bridge between the two of those. Occasionally I will get a really good, just sassy voice, and I'll think that needs to be a character, and I'll just jump off with that and pair it with an incident. But I kind of always have a running list of like, what ifs if this happened, and a running list of crazy people, and then I kind of put them together like, you know, one of those flip books where the head doesn't match up with the body, doesn't match up with the legs. Those are always the more interesting stories that the unexpected. Uh, like writing's about practice. How do I get back in uh, as an adult with a busy life and many other aspirations? How do I get back into the practice of writing? Okay. Well, I, my, I think that's really hard. I think it's hard for people that are writing full-time or people that are working full-time and want to write um it's to me it's kind of like exercise like i don't want to do it i gotta drag myself to do it but i have this belief that if you could just start out writing 250 words a day which is one page you can look at it like if i did that every day at the end of the year i have 365 pages not that they all go together but it's a, it's it's it makes it a little less intimidating like i need to write a book so if I'm having a really hard time, I just say, just write a page. Whether that's flash fiction or just like gobbledygook, um, it's at least getting the engine, engine going. Um, and then I also believe that for writer's block, the, the cure, at least for me, the absolute cure, is to read um, my favorite authors just if I read three short stories by Joy Williams, I'm like, I gotta write a story. You know, so, you know, maybe having your, everybody's always like, what book are you reading? I'm like, oh, the same one over and over for 15 years. <laughs> like, I'm the worst reader because I just keep going back to the people I love. So. I definitely second what Whitney said. Um, good writing really uh, inspires. And you are not gonna be a good writer if you're not reading, even if you're reading stuff that's not amazing, which you should at least sometimes read stuff that's amazing, um, you're not going to be a good writer at all. You're not going to be a published writer if you are not reading. Um, for me, I talked about that brain thing. I have bipolar disorder. So often I went very long periods in depressed states, which was how my mental illness mostly um, presented. So in depressed states, I did not write. Some people are driven to the page when they are depressed and when they are sad, which of course, while I'm on medication now, I'm stable, but grief brought me to the page when I was very busy at this job and not writing. Um, but Often I just kind of went with the ebb and flow of, of what my brain was doing. During the depressed stages it was ebb, and during hypomanic or manic stages it was flow. And I often, um, there were times that just for years I just didn't write. I had never except for one time been the type of writer that sat down every day um, and wrote except for right after we graduated from Spalding, a friend of mine, Stephen Dos Santos, and I hadn't been writing. It's very common not to write right after you graduate. People get back into their lives, they're not in the MFA program anymore. So most of my friends, you know, were working and it's like, I wish I could write. So Stephen and I decided to become write or die partners. And we committed to 1,000 words every day. Um, and every day, we checked in. You know, I wrote, I wrote my 1,000. It did not matter if we wrote good uh, writing or bad writing. We just were putting the words down on the page in several months. I don't remember exactly how many both of us had finished drafts of books. and. Um, um, I revised a YA novel that I had literally had been working on for 18 years. I'm a very fast writer. This is the 
only book that I just did not have the skill to pull off until after my MFA program. And, you know, then other things got in the way. So, um, take heart. Uh, the muse is just waiting for you. Write when you can. Don't feel guilty. And uh, read. And, and when, it, when the muse calls you, answer. It's, there is no one way. Not everybody is capable of writing every day. I could not do that every day um, most of the time. I write in big first. Even when I'm mentally well, that just works for me. So if you can write on the weekend or something like that, do what works for you and for your life. No guilt. Well, I, I think the second most common question I get is, how do you find the time? I think people hear ER doctor, mother, I have three kids, a husband, a neurotic dog, I teach at the medical school, I teach writing classes, and now novelist, and they assume that I'm doing those things competently. <laughs> and I am not, <laughs> at all. So I, I think in the beginning when I was trying to do everything, it was not working out. I was rushing out the door with my clothes on inside out, and I was forgetting to pick up the children, and <laughs> no one was eating. And eventually I think if you want to seriously write, you have to carve out time by giving up stuff. Um, in my case, I gave up television for a couple of years, and I gave up a bunch of volunteering that I really loved. Because I think writing, for me at least, takes a lot of time. I need a block of time, a long block of time, where I can really get into it. I can't write in little bits and spurts the way some people can. Um, but I think if you want to write, you know, if you feel a calling to do that, you know, it's going to kind of throb in your brain until you do it. And you do it because you love it, because there's something compelling and enjoying and almost, you know, necessary about doing that. And you'll find some joy in that process. And I absolutely third what they said about reading. I keep a stack of my favorite 10 novels in my desk drawer. And whenever I am sick of writing, I just pull one out at random, open it at random, read a passage. And I've said this so many times I have it memorized. It does sometimes not work out when I compare the celestial brilliance of whatever my favorite writers have written to my own future disaster <laughs> in the making. <laughs> but it is inspiring because I love words and I love stories and I love language and I love the ability to communicate with other human beings and I think that will inspire you to, to work on whatever it is you're working on. Thank you. It doesn't, it's not only, um, well you gotta read, but it's not only um, literature that can inspire you to start writing. Uh, a song can inspire you to start writing. A, a beautiful piece of art can inspire you to start writing. And if you're wondering, well, I don't even know how to start, Carnegie Center has some writing classes in lots of genres, and we have something called the free writing practice where we will give prompts, and then you can write from that. And so for a lot of people, that's a great way to get started again, and it's free. I'm a researcher, and I'm particularly interested in research-driven narrative, and I find it fascinating how that can, what you find, can drive the plot, and you can change the plot. So my question is primarily for Kimberly. Um, you're writing a fictional novel, but about a non-fiction event, and I'm just curious, did your research at the CDC and elsewhere actually influence how you're novel turned out. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I am in awe of historical fiction writers for that reason, because they do the most amazing, incredible research about real events. And in my case, I was researching a real subject, which hadn't yet become a real event, but we know how that turned out. So I crowdsourced a huge group of nerds at the CDC and the NIH, the WHO, um, infectious disease doctors and virologists and epidemiologists in private practice and with all these agencies, some of whom are insanely famous now. <laughs> I won't name names, but you all know who I'm talking about. Um, but one of the people I interviewed while I was researching is, a, a, to me, a young woman named Kizzy Corbett. 
um, Dr. Corbett. She's a PhD immunologist at the time with the NIH and now with Harvard. But she had been working for years on mRNA vaccines for coronaviruses prior to the COVID outbreak. So I was lucky enough to talk to her. And in fact, the president of the United States in my book is named Dr. Cor or named um, President Corbett in her honor. Um, but yes, so I found out things from talking to all these experts and from reading all these books that definitely influenced the direction of the plot. The, the biggest example being the decision that the mom has to make between her children. Um, I stumbled across that in a, a book I read in early 2019 by uh, Richard Preston, the guy that wrote The Hot Zone. He, read, he wrote another book called Crisis in the Red Zone. And that might sound familiar to you because this was all over the news in 2014. There was an aid camp in Sierra Leone where a doctor and another medical worker contracted Ebola, which is a highly fatal illness, especially in the absence of intensive care. And they just happened to have one dose of a completely experimental antiviral medication called ZMAP at this camp. Um, and it was almost entirely theoretical. There were only six doses in the world. Uh, it had never been given to a human being before. And the medical director of this camp had to literally make a decision between his two dying colleagues. Should he give it to one of the two of them? Should he give it to neither of them, since it had never been given to anybody before and it could kill them outright? Should he give it to one of these two privileged people, these two privileged Westerners, when there were people dying of Ebola all over the place? You know, so it, it, I thought, well, this is an absolutely fascinating, horrific, moral dilemma. And I had the same thought that all of you are having right now, which is, what if those two people had been his children? I'm kidding, because nobody has that thought unless they're a writer. <laughs> but the mantra of all fiction writers is you put your characters in the worst possible moral, ethical dilemma within the bounds of plausibility and kind of up the ante as much as you can. So doing all this research really did lead me to develop a bunch of different plot points that wouldn't have otherwise been in the book that were purely my own imagination. Well, let's give our authors a round of applause.